By 1960, Ruger was a rapidly growing company due to the success of its 22 semi-automatic pistols and cowboy-style revolvers. But Bill Ruger had bigger ambitions and wanted to enter the world of rifles. Ruger introduced the Model 44 carbine in 1961, which was mildly successful, and he developed the 1022, which was a culmination of design elements that Bill Ruger had been thinking about for decades. But Ruger wanted a proper hunting rifle, one that was just as reliable as the Mauser K98 he was so fond of, but it had to be easy to produce. In 1963, when Winchester stopped making controlled round feed Model 70s, the hunting world was shocked and Bill Ruger saw an opportunity. Ruger sought the help of a master rifle designer and quickly hired Jim Sullivan to help build a bolt action hunting rifle. In addition to developing the M77 for Ruger, Sullivan also had a hand in developing the Ultimax 100 light machine gun, the M16, the Ruger Mini 14, the AR-10, and the M14. As one of the top engineers in firearm design, Sullivan designed the receiver and bolt of the M77 to be produced using Ruger's new investment casting process. Yep, that's right. The receiver and bolt of the M77 was completely made from cast steel. Cast steel is usually looked down upon in the firearm industry, but Ruger did it right. So I'm going to uh, test this old M77 receiver just to verify what uh, alloy they were making these receivers out of. You know, we basically already know. And uh, these are made out of uh, 4140 steel. So chromoly steel, pretty standard chromoly steel. Of course, it's uh, not forged, it's investment cast. Jim Sullivan's rifle design was completed and in production in three years. This original design was actually a push feed action. These were not controlled round feed rifles originally, like a lot of people think they were. It had a closed bolt face, which required the clock extractor to pop in the place over the cartridge to chamber around. It also had a uh, plunger style ejector instead of the uh, Mauser style fixed ejector on it. The safety is a uh, two position tank safety and it had an angled front action screw that uh, was pretty unique at the time. In the later years, the M77 would be improved with the Mark II and the Hawkeye rifles. In this video, we'll explore the history of one of America's most iconic hunting rifles, the Ruger M77. The original M77 didn't really have a warm welcome into the firearms world. It had a slow start, mainly due to fears about this cast receiver, but it eventually became an acquired taste. You know, also in the interest of being honest and objective in this video, the first version of the M77 did have some issues. The first issue was accuracy. Ruger sourced its M77 barrels from all over the place. If you were lucky and got a Douglas barrel, it probably shot great. But if you got someone else's barrel, it probably didn't shoot great. For the first 20 years of production with the M77, barrels were kind of hit and miss with the M77. Finally, in about, I don't know, 1988, Ruger started making its own barrels in its own factory and the accuracy issues went away for the most part. So target shooters didn't really take an interest in this original M77, but the hunting world did embrace the original M77. Hunters found that the M77 action was highly reliable in dirty, nasty conditions, and that big clock extractor would always pull dirty, cases out of the chamber when you needed it. 
many hunters just loved the old tang safety, and some didn't. But rumor has it that Bill Ruger wanted a safety like the safety on a fine over and under shotgun. Indeed, if you're an avid upland hunter with an over and under, this M77 tang safety just feels natural, do you? The big boost in M77 sales to hunters came when Jack O'Connor himself started promoting the M77 in his writings. Jack became upset with Winchester in 1964 because of the redesign of the Model 70. So in the late 1960s and through the 1970s, O'Connor promoted the M77 instead. The Outdoor Life series about his family hunt in Zambia in 1969 showcased Brad O'Connor taking game with his M77 rifle, and it really got sales moving. In fact, Jack O'Connor's last hunting rifle was a custom M77 chambered in 280 Remington. The M77 was plagued with the problem known as the Ruger Click or the Ruger Bang, where some rifles would fire on safe and other rifles wouldn't fire at all. To address this, Ruger finally had a safety recall because of a defective trigger over travel screw. If you haven't had this mod done to your old tank safety M77, do it now. Ruger started doing the trigger mod in the late 80s, and many M77 owners sent their gun back to Ruger over the years for the recall mod. If the mod was done to your M77, there'll be a T inscribed under the bolt handle. Let's discuss the trigger a little bit more. The original trigger was adjustable. That's right, it was adjustable and was probably better than the Mark II and the Hawkeye triggers. But don't let that fool you, this still wasn't a great trigger. The M77 came from the factory with a 7 or 8 pound trigger and the most you can adjust this down to was about 4.5 or 5 pounds. But to be honest with you, in the 60s, 70s, and most of the 80s, a 4.5 or 5 pound trigger was considered perfectly fine for a hunting rifle, and some even considered it ideal. But uh, my problem with a lot of, with these old triggers is they just had more creep and over travel than the Winchesters and Remingtons of the day. So these triggers aren't great. Gunsmiths begin honing the trigger and cutting a loop off the spring almost immediately to get a better trigger out of these. But eventually a new lighter trigger springs came out, but those really tended to do very little for this trigger. For some odd reason, this trigger just doesn't respond well to lighter springs like a lot of triggers do. And then finally, Timney came out with a trigger for the Mark I tank safety guns, but it's very expensive and requires a lot of stock in inletting and multiple stoning sessions on the sear to get it to work right. But once that Timney trigger set, it's awesome, but it takes a lot of work and money to get there. Then, Rifle Basics came out with the RUT sear, which stands for Ruger Tang. This is under $40 and is honestly one of the best things you can do for a Tang Safety M77. Check this out. So I put the factory sear back in this old Tang Safety M77. And let's see what the uh, trigger pull is on this. Oh, it's, it's adjusted as light as it'll go with the factory sear in it. This is a bone stock factory trigger. Let's see. That's uh, five pounds, five and a quarter pounds. So, I mean, that's... That's as light as it goes, five and a quarter pounds. And uh, I'll put the aftermarket, the rifle basic sear back in it, and we'll see what a difference it makes.
Okay, now that we have this uh, Rifle Basics RUT trigger sear in this old Tang Safety M77, let's see what the difference in trigger pull is. Just over two and a half pounds. Let's try that again. Once again, just over two and a half pounds. The original Tang Safety M77 had a 23 year run that cemented Ruger into the bolt action rifle market. But Ruger knew that improvements could be made to this design. And unlike many companies, Ruger actually listened to customer feedback. In 1991, Ruger introduced the M77 Mark II. The Mark II took the hunting world by storm because they made it a true controlled round feed rifle. Hunters hadn't seen a controlled round feed rifle in about 27 years, and Ruger delivered. In response, Winchester quickly released a Model 70 Classic with controlled round feed the following year. In addition to controlled round feed, the Mark II replaced the tank safety with a really nice three-position wing safety. The plunger ejector was also replaced with a Mauser-style blade ejector. They also dumped the cast steel bolt and went with a stainless bolt. Ruger also fixed most of the random accuracy issues by making their own barrels in-house. The Mark II had every feature a hunter wanted in an action. These changes to the M77 were a huge success and skyrocketed Ruger's stake in the bolt action world. But there were, there were a couple of changes that people tended to frown upon. They dumped that adjustable trigger of the original M77 and went with a really heavy, gritty, non-adjustable trigger. I've seen Mark IIs with 10-pound factory triggers. Just about everybody hated the Mark II trigger. Another change that people hated was the stock. They changed the contour and thickness of the Mark II wood stocks, and people hated them. Then Ruger came out with a flimsy, ugly polymer stock, affectionately known as the boat paddle. The skinny little toe and heel on those boat paddle stocks bruised many a shoulders back in the day. The new stock designs also made it to where the Mark II usually held one less round in the magazine compared to the original M77, and hunters really didn't like that change. Another minor issue was that Mark II floor plates were often very hard to release. I heard many complaints about this back in the day. Stories of people having to pry their floor plates open were pretty common during the first runs of the Mark II. But as time went on, aftermarket stocks and triggers hit the market, and many hunters felt like the M77 Mark II was the perfect hunting rifle. The Mark II Magnum actions were an instant hit when they came out. They came chambered in big thumping cartridges like 375 H&H, &H, 416 Rigby, and the mighty 458 Lot. These rifles gained an instant following from Alaska to Zimbabwe. But some of those rifles did have issues because of that tiny recoil lug. And it essentially forced the action screw to take a lot of the recoil forces. It was almost mandatory to pillar bed those Magnum rifles, which really isn't an easy task with a Ruger's receiver design. But with the Mark II gaining popularity, everything was looking bright for Ruger. But Bill Ruger himself was about to sabotage the company and make Ruger a bad word in the household of most firearm owners. In the 1990s, Bill Ruger sided with leftists in trying to ban magazines and so-called assault weapons. He was seen on TV telling the media about how simple civilians couldn't be trusted with such things. Ruger went as far as supporting waiting periods and gun registration. The anti-gun movement quickly embraced Bill Ruger as their champion of gun control and used him as an example. His letters to Congress supporting gun control were stated as being part of the reason gun control measures 
even passed in the 90s. As a result, gun owners started boycotting Ruger. Bill Ruger became one of the most hated figures in the firearm industry, erasing a legacy of ingenious firearm design and sound company management. So the M77 Mark II started with a huge outpouring of support and ended on a sour note. But in retrospect, the Mark II was an example of one of the first times in history that a rifle manufacturer actually listened to customer feedback and drastically changed their design to meet those needs, rather than changing a design just to make it cheaper. By 2003, Bill Ruger Sr. was dead. Corporate directors tried to change the company and mend the bad reputation that Ruger had with its customers. Eventually, enough of time had passed to where most people forgot about the drama and were ready to give Ruger another chance. In 2006, Ruger released the next generation of the M77, the Hawkeye. Basically, the Hawkeye kept all of the improvements of the Mark II, but included an improved trigger and a much better stock design. The Hawkeye got a reputation right out of the gate and was liked by just about everyone who bought one. The price was right, and the Hawkeye came chambered and a lot of awesome cartridges. The Hawkeye's vast array of laminate, synthetic, and hardwood stocks, coupled with the huge variety of barrel profiles and stainless options, made the Hawkeye an instant success. The Hawkeye was initially a blow for Winchester, especially with the Model 70, and like what happened when the Mark II was released, a year after the Hawkeye was released, the Model 70 was reinvented again a year later by FN in direct response to the Hawkeye. The big hoopla with the release of the new Hawkeye was the guide gun and the new Hawkeye African. The African was probably the most handsome and feature-packed rifle that Ruger's ever made. But there was a problem. If you wanted a dangerous game caliber like 375 or 416, you had to use Ruger's new proprietary 375 Ruger and 416 Ruger cartridges. This proprietary ammo was hard to find, limited, and only made by Hornady. Because of this, Winchester's Model 70 Safari Express instantly stole most of the market share away from Ruger because the Model 70 was chambered in common 375 H&H, &H, 416 Remington Magnum, and 458 Win Mag cartridges. From a practical and profit standpoint, the 375 and 416 Ruger cartridges were a costly mistake that doomed the Hawkeye African to obscurity. The Hawkeye comes in a huge array of different configurations. Its diversity ensures that there's a Hawkeye rifle to suit any need, taste, or style of hunting. Today, the Hawkeye enjoys a healthy following by people who like a well-built, controlled round feed rifle that's made in America. The Hawkeye is the pinnacle of Jim Sullivan's Model 77 creation. Bill Ruger envisioned a high-end hunting rifle that everyone can afford, and in the end, that will be the legacy of the M77. I bet you think that investment cast receivers and odd-shaped recoil lugs are the biggest controversy with the M77. Well, they aren't. The biggest controversy is the configuration codes that Ruger used to identify the rifles over the years. I put together some of the common codes used on the M77 and the Mark II, uh, the first two generations of this rifle. These codes are for the most common M77 rifles. Then we have codes for special edition rifles. The special edition codes are as follows. And then we move to the Hawkeye series. 
with the Hawkeye series, people tend to just use the configuration name rather than the configuration code. The configuration names for the Hawkeye are as follows. This rifle right here was one of the first hunting rifles that I ever bought with my own money. I bought this in 1990, and it's a Tang Safety M77 made in 1989. And it's chambered in 270 Winchester. It's topped with a loophole uh, Very X2 3 to 9 by 40 scope on it which was also made in 1989. So this is a 1989 rifle with a 1989 loophole scope on it. I mean, it looks just like the ads in the magazines I used to read back in the 80s. You know, this was my dream rifle back then. This combination of rifle and scope was well above my budget back then. But I had a second job laying tile on the weekends and... I ended up buying it anyway. I told myself at the time that this was the last hunting rifle I'd ever need to buy. But as my viewers know, that was a promise I was unable to keep. <laughs> Just looking at this rifle, topped with the first loophole scope I ever owned, brought joy to my heart and made me wonder what hunting trips and adventures were in store for me in this new rifle. But soon, my dreams of becoming the second coming of Jack O'Connor were crushed. You see, this rifle was the most inaccurate gun I'd ever shot up to that point. I tried dozens of different types of ammo, and just none of it would shoot well out of this rifle. In the 90s, I became interested in building my own rifles. You know, I took some classes and became buddies with a couple of great old timers who took me under their wing. And I do come from a background of machinists and welders. So, you know, I was already skilled in that by the time I was out of my teens. At the time, at that time when I started doing all of this, I thought about that old M77 that I had sitting in the back of my closet and decided to try to make this rifle shoot good. So the first thing I did to this rifle is I bedded the action into it. And I was also starting to reload my own ammunition by this time and decided to do some load development with this rifle. But to make a long story short, I was able to get this rifle down from a three MOA gun to an inch and a half gun, which I mean, you know, uh, I... I cut the accuracy in half on it. Compared to other rifles I owned at the time, though, this Ruger just didn't really interest me. You know, I figured I just maybe didn't have a good barrel on it, or, you know, maybe I'd just rebarrel it in the future at some point. And uh, this rifle went back into storage for years. When I started working on guns myself for profit, we'd regularly get M77s in for trigger work and accuracy issues. And that's when I started learning a lot of things about this rifle. Firstly, the M77 is more sensitive to action screw torque than any rifle platform I've ever worked with. Each screw has wildly different torque needs and they want to be torqued in a particular order. Originally, Ruger didn't give out torque specs for their rifles, so most owners torqued the screws like they would with a Remington or a Winchester. This turned out to be a huge mistake. This front screw is supposed to be torqued to 95 inch-pounds. You heard that right, 95 inch-pounds. Most gunsmithing torque wrenches don't even go that high. Ruger also stupidly 
use slotted screws for a while on this front screw. And it was virtually impossible to get even close to that level of torque with a lot of those slotted screws. After torquing the front screw to 95 inch pounds, most Smiths torque the rear screw to about 50 inch pounds and tighten the middle screw to where it's just snug. You know, always torque the front action screw first. This is very important. But there were other problems with this front screw too. Mainly that it would mysteriously come loose on you and groups would open up tremendously. And there were two causes of this. First of all, that 95 inch pounds of torque on that front screw would sometimes compress the wood and cause this uh, screw to loosen right here. A pillar, bedding, a pillar bedding job was pretty much the cure for that. And pillar jobs are a pain in the ass with the M77. The second reason for that loose screw is that Ruger claimed that they used a bad batch of action screws that would yield under torque. So it might be wise to order a new front screw. Just make sure that it's a hex head screw so you can get the proper torque with it easier. You know, it's really hard to get the proper torque with these slotted screws. So a hex head like this is a good idea. Also, along these same lines, you have to be sure that this magazine box is floating in the stock when everything is torqued. If the action is sandwiched between the magazine box with any force, it'll flex the center of the action and the rifle will never shoot good. Torque flex is the worst thing you can do to a rifle from an accuracy standpoint. And you guessed it, this rifle right here, the problem was action screw torque. Now this is a sub-MOA rifle. Then, lapping rings became very popular, and gunsmiths were getting lots of requests to install bases, rings, and scopes for customers. I started noticing a trend with the Ruger M77 that many of the factory rings that Ruger was providing with the rifles needed a lot of lapping. Some of those old Ruger rings were just horrible. <laughs> but admittedly, Ruger seems to have rectified that poor quality with the old rings, and their newer rings actually look pretty decent. These days, I highly recommend the worn Maxima vertical rings for M77s. These rings require no lapping at all, because the ring is designed to flex around the tube, unlike other designs. And... I like to use these rings in applications where I'm not using a one-piece rail. So these are perfect for the M77. Just make sure that you watch the instructional video on how to properly install, install these rings because they're very easy to install wrong and you won't get good results if you don't install them right. If you didn't read the instructions or watch the video from Warren, you're probably installing these wrong. And now, let's talk about recoil pads, because the factory recoil pads on the M77 absolutely sucked. These iconic red pads, you know, signify that you're an old-school Ruger guy, but they also signify that your shoulder gets a lot of bruises. These old red pads, hard and quick, you know, usually feeling like a rock, after about two years of use. But even when they were new, they really didn't do much to mitigate recoil. Ruger's bad reputation for recoil wasn't so much the stock design as it is these crappy recoil pads that they put on their rifles. You know, I, I replaced the recoil pad on this rifle a couple of times over its life, and it currently wears a limb saver pad on it, which works fantastic. But here's the bad news. No aftermarket company makes recoil pads that fit the M77 good. Really, I think all of them are made for the Ruger number one and are rebranded as working for the M77 too. 
But uh, all of these so-called direct fit recoil pads for the M77 will probably require new holes or modification to uh, the pad itself. And it's probably going to need a little bit of grinding on it. So in my opinion, it's best to just buy a grind to fit recoil pad and do it yourself. If you have an old uh, tank safety red padded wonder, you know, uh, this mod is definitely worth it in my opinion. Out of every bolt action hunting rifle on the market, the M77 seems to be the most controversial. Some people think it's an inferior design with a weak cast receiver and a tiny recoil lug that puts all the force on a tiny bolt. Others think it's the greatest innovation since the Mauser K98. It's one of those rifles that people either like or hate. Perhaps this cast receiver is a little bit weaker than a forged receiver. I don't know. But tell me the truth. Have you ever seen an M77 receiver break or blow up? And if you have, does it happen with any more frequency than a, uh, a Remington 700 does? I mean, I can't say that. I've never seen one of these actions break. You know, maybe people have become so consumed with Browning and Winchester and Sacco rifles that they forget that there's another option out there that offers similar quality for the price. You know, Ruger also has a reputation for having fantastic customer service. I mean, where else are you going to get an American-made controlled round feed rifle for a reasonable price these days? The M77 is it. Personally, I think that the M77 is a great rifle for most hunting situations. For everything from varmints to moose, the M77 should be on your list of hunting rifle choices. Ruger has proven itself to make a quality product at a good price using American labor, so I can't fault them for that. But I also think that Ruger really dropped the ball with their Hawkeye Dangerous Game Rifles. They really should have made them with a Magnum Action chambered in common cartridges and really should have added an extra recoil lug into the receiver or barrel. But in the end, the M77 has proven itself to be a reliable working man's rifle that's attractive and just loaded with features. Whether you're a tank safety guy or a Hawkeye hunter, the M77 will go down as, in history as one of America's most iconic hunting rifles. Well, I hope you enjoyed my video on the Ruger Model 77. There's a lot more to cover with this rifle, I think, but I just couldn't cram it all into one video. You can reach me with any questions or comments at DesertDogOutdoors at gmail.com. As always, thank you for watching and good hunting.